Welcome back to Roots Music History. On this podcast, we talk about stories behind songs and legends, as well as moments in history and sometimes new up and coming artists in a playlist called History in the Making. But on today's episode, we are doing part two of the Stevie Ray Vaughan series, deep diving into the helicopter crash that changed the course of music history forever. It was August 27th, 1990, when a helicopter crashed near East Troy, Wisconsin. There's been a major blow to the rock music world. A deadly helicopter crash early this morning in Wisconsin. Five people have been killed, including rock guitarist Stevie Ray Vaughan. It resulted in the death of one of the greatest guitarists of all time, Stevie Ray Vaughan. They were leaving the Alpine Valley Music Theater. He wasn't unfamiliar with this venue. Most of the time, he would just fly from Chicago to Wisconsin and then from Wisconsin back to Chicago. It was a very easy, routine flight. Now, this pivotal moment in music history has been discussed for years and years and years in many different ways. But on today's episode on Roots, we are going into all of the old newspaper clippings and discussing every single detail of that crash and that day. We're also going to talk about a very chilling premonition Stevie Ray had just one day before he died. I guess it's just something I'll, I'll never get over that. I'll, I'll get better about it, but I'll never get over it. If you have not watched part one of the Stevie Ray Vaughan series on the channel, I highly recommend you stop what you're doing right now and go watch part one before you watch this. Not only will watching part one give you a better understanding of who all of the characters and players are in this story, but it will also give you a very deep appreciation for everything that happened to Stevie Ray Vaughan and led him up to this moment. By the summer of 1990, Stevie Ray Vaughan had several gold albums under his belt as well as a platinum album, and he had won two Grammy Awards. The most recent Grammy that he had won was in January of 1990, when he won a Grammy for his new album, In Step. It was hard for him to go pretty much anywhere in the beginning of 1990 without someone asking him for his autograph or telling him how much they loved his music. Stevie was also three and a half years sober, and so were his bandmates. They had been through a lot together. You definitely need to watch part one to fully appreciate everything Chris Layton and Tommy Shannon had been through with Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stevie gave an interview to the Akron Beacon Journal on June 21st, 1990, where he said, quote, he was the happiest he'd ever been. He had taken a slight step back from being out on the road. He was still traveling and he was still doing shows, but he definitely was not doing the shows at the level he was doing them back in 1985 or 1986 at the height of his addictions. Once he got sober, he realized that go, go, go life was not sustainable, but also very unhealthy. So he was at a much easier pace going into 1990. This also allowed Stevie to do some things that he'd been wanting to do for a long time, one of which was playing with his brother, Jimmy. Not a single interview would go by where Stevie Ray Vaughan wouldn't mention his brother, Jimmy. I talk a lot about their relationship in part one of the series, and it's important to stress the fact Stevie absolutely adored Jimmy. My brother's probably... The biggest Texas guitar influence that I know of, Jimmy Vaughn. They started playing together more and more in 1990 and were able to solidify a contract to release their very first album together as brothers. This was a big deal for them going into this year because they had played together before, but it was always Stevie's band playing with Jimmy's band. It was never just Stevie playing with Jimmy. They were excited not only for themselves to put together an album together, but they were excited just to put that out into the world. It was years in the making and just took them a couple of months to put together. I also want to note that in Stevie Ray Vaughan's sobriety, he became more and more aware of anything that he thought could be unhealthy in his life. He wanted to be on earth for as long as possible and wanted to do everything in his power to be as healthy and as conscientious as possible, which is why in 1990, he started playing with a big partition of plexiglass between him and the amplifiers on the stage. He said he knew he was starting to lose his hearing and he did not want to lose any more of it. This is something he never really would have thought about if he was still doing substances and constantly drunk. It was a big change 
change for Stevie Ray Vaughan and you could tell how much he valued his life and how much he appreciated the fact that he was given this second chance at life. In the spring of 1990, he teamed up with Joe Cocker and they planned to do a bunch of music festivals over the summer. One of the first ones they did, they had played with B.B. King, Dr. John, and Irma Thomas. It was at the Benson and Hedges Blues Festival and it was the first of many more festivals Stevie Ray was set to play that summer. In addition to playing these festivals and doing a few gigs here and there, he and Jimmy were also in the studio, as I mentioned earlier, working on this album. Jimmy and Stevie were very tight-lipped about the album they were putting out together. They wanted their fans to be surprised. When asked about the Brothers album, Jimmy would just kind of say, it's very Vaughn. Stevie said, quote, we've had a lot of fun keeping everybody guessing about what it's going to be like. For once, I'd like people to hear a record when it's completely finished. We're not even saying where we're going to record it. One thing they did reveal to the public was the release date, which was scheduled for September 25th, 1990. They also let everyone know that the album would be called Family Style. For the first half of 1990, newspapers everywhere were reporting on Stevie Ray Vaughan's newfound outlook on life. They were praising him for his sobriety and also praising him for his new music. The week before August 27th, the Wisconsin newspapers and surrounding areas started posting about Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eric Clapton set to play at this Alpine Valley Music Festival. While the headline on the newspaper might have looked like something small, one small line item mentioning a concert, the show itself was anything but small. It was going to be a seven-hour, two-night event that was held at the Alpine Music Theater in East Troy, Wisconsin, which was an open venue, open air concert venue. Stevie was ecstatic to be playing with Eric Clapton again. He and Eric Clapton had become quite close, especially when Stevie Ray Vaughan had been overseas. In fact, the facility Stevie Ray Vaughan went to, the addiction facility, was the same one that Eric Clapton had been to. And Eric Clapton in general had been a very positive force in Stevie's life and in his sobriety journey. Stevie actually was a little jealous of Eric Clapton and the way Eric just seemed so, in Stevie's words, relaxed on stage. Stevie always knew and felt that his shows were a little heavy, a little in your face, a little rushed. A lot of that feeling came from the fact that Stevie had been so dependent on substances and alcohol. And a lot of his shows, he was really wired when he did them. So he really admired that cool, calm and collected vibe Eric Clapton had on stage while just also ripping into the guitar. He thought that was the coolest combination and Eric Clapton just nailed that persona. Stevie made an active effort to try to encompass that persona that Eric Clapton had. So he was beyond excited to play with Eric in America. He was also incredibly excited to be playing with his brother, Jimmy. Now, Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton also were playing at this Alpine Valley Music Festival. Chris Layton and Tommy Shannon were like brothers to Stevie. TV. If you have not seen my Roots documentary on Eric Clapton, by the way, I will link it in the corner of this video and in the description down below. The show started the evening of August 25th, which was a Saturday. Robert Cray opened the show with a 14 song opening set. This show was massive. I cannot stress that enough. <laughs> there were a few rumors that Robert Cray and Stevie Ray Vaughan were going to get up on stage together and do a duet set. Those rumors were unfounded and people were slightly disappointed when that wasn't really unfolding. However, there was a surprise at the end of the night. Eric Clapton brought on Jeff Healy to play two of his encores. The entire crowd had no idea Jeff Healy was there. Jeff Healy had played there a few weeks, a few days, actually like 10 days prior, but they didn't know he was still in town. So that was very exciting for them. I believe the first night Stevie Ray's encore was Voodoo Child. I could be wrong about that. If you know for sure on August 25th, what Stevie Ray's encore was, comment it down below. Eric Clapton then got on stage and started blending all of his songs from all of the phases of his 25 year long career. He opened with the song Pretending and went into the song No Alibis from there, which were both new songs on his most recent album. And then he went into a lot of his classics, which obviously really got the crowd going. Buddy Guy was also at this festival, but I think Buddy Guy only played on the second night. And again, I could be wrong about that. So if anyone has like a really good reference 
reference for the full show and set lists, that would be great. I found a limited set list and it didn't give all of the information that I wanted. But Buddy Guy was definitely there the second night, which was August 26th, which was a Sunday. And the very last encore on Sunday, August 26th was Stevie Ray Vaughan playing Sweet Home Chicago with everyone he adored on stage with him. Eric Clapton came on stage, Buddy Guy came on stage, Jimmy Vaughn was on stage for this encore, so was Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton. Literally everyone Stevie Ray Vaughan absolutely loved was with him. They were all playing kind of soft guitar backups to Stevie Ray Vaughan, who was absolutely destroying this song, Sweet Home Chicago. You can watch the full recording of this live show. I will put the link in the description down below. You can watch every single song that was played at this music festival. But most importantly, you can watch this last song of Stevie Ray Vaughan that he ever played. But it's very spooky to watch it back, knowing that is Stevie Ray Vaughan's last performance ever. The fact that everyone he loved was on stage with him that night is just an incredible way to end an incredible career. Jimmy says Stevie that entire day was happier than usual. He just had a smile and this energy to him that was very special on that day. After the show was over, Stevie Ray Tommy Shannon, Chris Layton, Jimmy Vaughn, Eric Clapton and his entourage and Buddy Guy and everybody, they're all backstage and they started to have kind of a deep heart to heart. Stevie Ray actually mentioned something he had mentioned to his band earlier on in the day, but he had a dream the day before that he was at his funeral. He said the dream was so vivid. He was at his funeral, but he wasn't there. It was like he was there, but he wasn't. His spirit was there and he could see everything that was happening. He said there were thousands of people there mourning his death and that it was absolutely terrifying, but he was extremely peaceful at the same time. And they're kind of having this deep conversation and it's becoming a very foggy night. The weather is getting a little questionable, but they're all still sitting back there chatting and the conversation starts to turn to Jimi Hendrix and how they lost such a legend when they lost Jimmy. They all agreed they should honor Jimi Hendrix in every way that they could, and they all came up with the idea they would all play again together at London's Albert Hall. Stevie was over the moon about this idea. He absolutely loved Jimi Hendrix. So the idea of doing a tribute concert for Jimi Hendrix, he was just over the moon excited about it. This very deep backstage heart-to-heart had to come to an end a little bit sooner than anticipated when Eric Clapton's tour manager had to interrupt everyone and say, look, I hate to be the party pooper, but the weather is getting really bad, so we better head out. So they all packed up their things and headed out to where four helicopters waited for them to fly all of them back to Chicago. Stevie said goodnight to Chris Layton and to Tommy Shannon and his brother and Eric and everyone, and he got in a helicopter with three other members of Eric Clapton. Clapton's entourage. Stevie Ray Vaughan's last words to Chris Layton were, I love you. Technically, it was I love ya, to be technically correct. Now, there are some rumors Stevie Ray Vaughan traded seats with Eric Clapton and that Eric Clapton was supposed to be in the seat Stevie Vaughan was in. But Eric Clapton's spokesman absolutely shut down these rumors. He said there was zero truth to them. The helicopter was owned by Omni Flight Helicopters Incorporated. Stevie Ray Vaughan's helicopter lifted it off at approximately 12.35 a.m., which was about the time everyone else took off to. It was just roughly 0.6 miles away from the takeoff location when the pilot lost visibility and ran the helicopter into a hill. Stevie Ray Vaughan was killed on impact. Those who were also killed in the crash were Bobby Brooks, who was Eric Clapton's agent at Creative Artists Agency. Bobby had also worked for Crosby, Stills & Nash, Whoopi Goldberg, Pat Benatar, Jeff Beck, Jackson Brown, Dolly Parton. The list kind of goes on and on. Losing Bobby Brooks was a lo huge loss to the music industry, in addition to Stevie Ray Vaughan. And obviously, anyone who does any type of job in the music industry, even if they are not 
not a visible member of the music industry, it's a huge loss. You, you only have so many people with so many set skills in this world. And losing Bobby Brooks was incredibly difficult, not just for Eric Clapton, but for everyone that he had worked with. Nigel Brown was also on board. He was one of Eric Clapton's bodyguards. Colin Smith, who was one of Eric Clapton's tour managers. And the pilot, a man named Jeff Brown, who was originally from the East Chicago side of Indiana. Eric Clapton was on one of the helicopters that landed safely in Chicago. The only helicopter that did not make it was the helicopter Stevie Ray Vaughan was on. It's a little unclear to me, once everyone else landed in Chicago, it seems, this is how, this is what I gathered. It seems as though Tommy Shannon, Chris Layton, and other members of the entourage went back to the hotel. They knew the helicopter Stevie was on hadn't arrived yet. They waited for half an hour, an hour, whatever it might have been, but they ended up going back to the hotel room. It seems like it was just one of those things where you know something's not right, but you just kind of continue on with things. Kind of like if you're a parent and you're waiting up for your kid to come home from a party and they're not home yet, but it's also not technically their curfew. So you decide to go to bed, but you're kind of going to bed with one eye open going, okay, you know, like when is she going to get back? I think it was exactly like that for Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton and anyone else who ended up leaving the airport and going back to the hotel that night. It wasn't until about 5 a.m. they decided to report the helicopter missing. And when I say they, I'm pretty sure it was Eric Clapton and whoever was immediately with him and kind of in charge of the operations. As the sun is starting to come up, Chris Layton wakes up and immediately has that feeling did Stevie get back? Is Stevie back? And I'm not clear if Chris had received information when he woke up that Stevie had been in a crash, or it, it seemed like to me, Chris had woken up not knowing any wreckage had been found, not knowing a crash had happened because Chris Layton ends up calling security and insisting they let him into Stevie Ray Vaughan's hotel room. Chris wanted to see for himself if Stevie was there or not. And I don't know if he wanted to see his room because he had been told this had happened and he didn't believe it, or if he wanted to see his room because he had this horrible feeling after going to bed knowing the helicopter hadn't landed yet. It makes me think it was him just being concerned and wanting to see if he had made it back and not knowing anything yet because it wasn't until about 7 a.m. the Sheriff's Department for Walworth County found the helicopter wreckage. I actually think the moment Chris Chris Layton was probably going into this hotel room is around probably the exact same moment the sheriff's department was finding all of this wreckage. Chris said as soon as they opened the door, he saw the bed had been turned down and there was a candy on Stevie Ray's pillow. And that's when he knew this was real and Stevie hadn't made it back. Now, whether he knew that the news was real or whether he knew in that moment, no matter what the news is, it's not going to be good because Stevie should be here. Like I said, I don't know. Um, but it was a really difficult moment for Chris Layton and also for Tommy Shannon. It's strange, you know, we'd done so much together. It totally ripped my life apart. I mean, if you remember, Tommy had been with Stevie Ray Vaughan since they were kids, since they were 12 or 13. According to the National Transportation Safety Board's official statement that was released on August 28th, they said, quote, the Bell helicopter jet ranger slammed into the back of a ski hill in heavy fog shortly after takeoff. They also confirmed there was no fire in the crash. A man named John Griebel was the Walworth County coroner at the time, and he was very quick to confirm all passengers had had died on impact. News immediately began to spread that Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eric Clapton's entourage had been in this terrible crash. But the most unsettling part of this entire morning is the newspapers. The newspapers had already drafted up and printed these big long cover stories about this amazing concert between Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eric Clapton the night before. And it was literally as the paper boy is throwing the newspaper onto people's front porches at 4.45, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning. It's in that exact moment they're reporting the helicopter missing and Stevie Ray Vaughan is being found. Eric Clapton his entire entourage who survived, 
Tommy Shannon, Chris Layton, Jimmy Vaughn, everyone comes down into the lobby of this hotel in Chicago on the morning of August 27th to see newspapers in the lobby with this incredible cover story about this incredible show. And they have just received the news that Stevie has died. I can't even imagine that juxtaposition and how surreal and, as Tommy Shannon says, confusing it felt. While the downside to all of this was that the newspapers had literally just printed this amazing story and just delivered the paper, despite this just happening, the good news in all of that, I suppose, is that the newspapers then had the entire day on August 27th to compile tributes to Stevie, to compile the accurate information about what happened, and to really put into their article a tremendous biography about who Stevie was. So the very first articles that came out about Stevie's death were very robust. They were filled with information about who he was, what he did in his career, all of the tributes from anyone who wanted to say anything. All of that could be included in the breaking news that he had died in a crash, which is very interesting because if you look at, for example, Buddy Holly's death, I talked about Don McLean and how he wrote the song American Pie and how Buddy Holly's death was, you know, such an inspirational factor for that song. But Don McLean, there's kind of a misconception that Don McLean saw Buddy Holly's death on the front page of the newspaper. In fact, there's a documentary out that shows this image of newspapers on a front porch and the very first cover story on the newspaper is Buddy Holly's death. The reality is I went into their local newspaper and I found from that day Buddy Holly's death. His death was on page four or five and it was a very small part of that page. It absolutely was not a headline story it wasn't definitely wasn't taking up the cover of the newspaper. And then I went back into Don McLean's interviews and he actually says he was thumbing through the newspaper when he saw the news of Buddy Holly's death. He does not say it was a front page story or anything like that. He actually went to school and was very upset because his schoolmates didn't even know that Buddy Holly had died and didn't care. So the good news with Stevie Vaughn's death is that the newspapers did have an entire day to get the facts straight and to really put out something of substance on August 28th. B.B. King was one of the first entertainers to put out a statement and a tribute to Stevie Ray that was featured in almost every newspaper that next day. B.B. King said, quote, Stevie Ray Vaughan was like one of my children. The loss is a great loss for blues music and all fans of music around the world. He was just beginning to be appreciated and develop his potential. Jeff Healy, who had also just played with Stevie Ray the night before, said, quote, Quote, Stevie Ray Vaughan was a great inspiration and personal friend who helped me immensely. He will be sadly missed by both myself and the world of music. Meanwhile, in Austin and San Antonio, Texas, hundreds of fans began to gather and hold candlelight vigils for Stevie Ray Vaughan and the legend he had created. Stevie would talk about death quite often. Stevie was a devout Christian and truly believed death didn't end someone, as he'd say. He'd say death changes a person. It doesn't end them. He also would speak about how he believed your spirit is always here. And even after you pass on, your spirit is here and is around all of your loved ones every single day. And the fact that Stevie Ray Vaughan would speak about that and had spoken about it quite often while he was here gave his brother and bandmates and fans a tremendous amount of comfort because they knew where Stevie Ray Vaughan stood on death and they knew he was at peace. It was exactly three days later on August 30th, Stevie was laid to rest in a grave in Dallas, right next to his father, who, if you remember, also died on August 27th, just four years prior. Now, if you watched part one, this name will sound familiar. Jackson Brown, if you remember the whole story with Jackson Brown and his LA studio and the baby horse, <laughs> Jackson Brown was at the funeral and assisted in singing Amazing Grace over the PA system. Yeah, you heard me right. There was a PA system. This funeral was enormous, just like Stevie had dreamt. Over a thousand people showed up to the grave site ceremony. The ceremony wasn't set to begin until noon, but crowds started to flood in as early as 10 o'clock in the morning. And this was also an extremely hot summer day in Texas. And people were showing up dressed completely in black, or they were wearing t-shirts from Stevie Ray's concerts. Most of them showed up in rep 
replica hats, just like Stevie used to wear, that black felt hat. Not only did they fill the entire grassy area of the cemetery, they were snaking around the fence area, past the barricades. They were overflowing into the road that led into the cemetery. This was absolutely insane. The turnout was incredible. Nobody minded standing there in three and a half to four hours of scorching heat to pay tribute to this incredible player. No matter where they were standing, they could hear what was happening because the people PA system had such a good volume and was able to reach so many people. So they could all hear Amazing Grace and they could all hear everything that was being said. Al Rogers, who was a producer on the album Jimmy and Stevie were working on, that album Family Style, he surprised everyone by bringing a cut of one of the songs that had been set for that album. The song was called TikTok. No one had ever heard the song before. Obviously, it was being saved for the release of Family Style style that next month. But Al Rogers thought it was important to bring one of those songs and play it at the ceremony. The song started to play over the PA system and every single person in that crowd went completely silent. If not for the deafening guitar licks of Stevie Ray and Jimmy Vaughn playing on this track, you could have heard a pin drop in that cemetery. Once the song was over, every single person, almost as if they were on cue, started erupting in applause and cheers and whistles. It was the most bittersweet moment, probably in American history. I was going to say music history, but I think in American history in general. The priest got up after the crowd kind of started to die down a little bit and said something to the effect of, I'm so glad that you knew how appropriate it was to cheer because, or something to that effect. I'm not sure his exact words, but it was something to the effect of how grateful he was that people were cheering and how appropriate it was. Because at a funeral, you would not expect people to erupt in cheers and applause and whistles. But hearing this song from Stevie, this never before heard song of not just Stevie, but him and his brother, something he dreamed about for years was playing with his brother. And here it was, what he always wanted. And and it brought tears to everyone's eyes. His fans were filled with this crazy, bittersweet feeling of he was such an amazing person and such a gift to music. And it was such a heavy, heavy loss um, on his fans, especially on his brother, Jimmy, and his mother, Martha, who was also there linking arms. And Jana was also there, who was Stevie Vaughn's fiance at the time. The original grave location for Stevie was section 35, lot 194, space 4. But he was eventually moved to Vaughn Estates with his father. I believe this move happened when his mother passed away so that his mother and his father and Stevie and in the future, Jimmy and Jimmy's wife and kids, they can all rest in peace together. But I couldn't find that much information about when the move actually took place. They might have moved them to Vaughn Estates before the mother's death. I'm just not sure. But when his mother died, her obituary was the sweetest obituary. I mean, she was an incredible woman. You can tell she absolutely loved her family. They described her as an oak tree and she was like the roots that held the family in place. They also said in addition or in lieu of flowers, you could donate to a pet relief charity. She loved animals and loved pets and was always giving back in that capacity whenever and however she could. So now the Vaughn Estates are in sections 10 and section 11. 26 days after Jimmy Vaughn buried his little brother. He decided he would release the album they had worked so hard on together. So on September 25th, 1990, the world got one last album from Stevie Ray Vaughan. Jimmy's career took a total left turn after his brother's death. He said he didn't want to play in public anymore. He didn't want to do music anymore. It was all just way too hard and way too sad. He took several years to focus on his family. He moved back to Austin, Texas and took care of his 
mom and his wife and his daughter. And he remodeled cars and kind of dabbled in music a little bit, but nothing like before. And then in 1993, Eric Clapton called Jimmy Vaughn and said, I think we need to do that show. And Jimmy Vaughn said, what show? And Eric said, the one Stevie and all of us were talking about that night, right before he left us. He was so excited about the possibility of doing a show at London's Albert Hall. And Eric said to Jimmy, I think we should go through with it. And Jimmy said, you know what? I think you're right. So Jimmy Vaughn and Eric Clapton went through with the show. They made it an entire tribute show to Stevie Ray Vaughan. This show really reignited Jimmy Vaughn's love for music. After this show, he realized, I can play music again. I'm never going to play it in the same way I played it with Stevie. It's never going to be like that. But I can play music as a tribute to to my brother. From that moment on, Jimmy decided to continue to play music in memory of his brother. It was soon after that experience with Eric Clapton, Jimmy Vaughn released an album. He released an album called Strange Pleasure, which I think is the perfect name. It's like the perfect synonym for bittersweet. It was like he was saying to everyone, it feels so good to be playing again, but it also feels so strange. The entire album was dedicated to Stevie Ray and to the late blues guitarist Albert Collins, who Stevie absolutely loved and would cover all the time. I think we can all agree we are very grateful to Eric Clapton for reigniting this desire in Jimmy to continue playing. Because of all of this, we've gotten so much more music from Jimmy Vaughn, and he has been such a staple in the music industry and has been such an inspiration for every generation of guitarists. Not only that, but he's done a tremendous job of keeping his little brother's memory eternal. You can find Jimmy Vaughn on Facebook and Instagram. I will put both of his profiles in the description down below. And I really hope that you are enjoying this Stevie Ray Vaughn series on my channel. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified when I post the next Roots Music History episode. YouTube changed its algorithm, so you're not going to see every video I post in your feed unless you click that bell icon and change it to all because it defaults to personalized. So click the bell, change it from personalized to all. And thank you so much to the Roots Music History family. You guys are making my heart so warm with all of your comments and stories. And I absolutely love reading everything you have to say, whether it's your experience, whether it's a detail that I couldn't include in my episode. Obviously, it's hard to include every single detail about everything. So that's where you come into play. And that's where the comment section really becomes a fun playground for music lovers everywhere to share experiences and memories. And we can all continue to grow and keep the conversation going. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of the family and I will see you on the next Roots Rockumentary. Hungry for the road all my life Thirsty for adventure all my youth Chasing all my freedoms down Liberty Avenue